Okay, so, uh, welcome back again. Uh, this will make the third episode of our Crusader Kings 2 tutorial series. Um, there will probably be a little bit of chopping and changing um, following this video. Like I said, I restarted the beginning of this tutorial series, partly because I wanted the content to be better, uh, but partly because there were quite a lot of audio issues. Um, so I've been re-recording all of this. So if after this video, the dynamic of what we're looking at changes a little bit, don't be too alarmed. It's just that we're working off of a different save. Um, but yeah, that was just to give you guys fair warning before we carry on. Right then. Uh, what are we going to do in this particular playthrough? Well, we've discussed every single one of these menus in some degree of detail. Uh, we'll be mentioning them more as time goes on. Let's instead uh, work out what we should do. So we know that we are the Count of Thurgau. Uh, so as the Count of Thurgau, um, what could we do to expand our realm and, and make things better? Well, first we're going to deal with this one alert that we said. So we said we didn't care about having uh, a holding of the wrong type, but we do care about having an unmarried ruler. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, we could click here into our uh, character or again press F2 uh, and we could click this arrange marriage button which will show us everybody uh, who is available for kind of being married um, that's not the way that I prefer to do it so what I'm going to teach you instead is if you close all this down not that you need to but it's just cleaner uh, let's hit the uh, full stop or period key uh, and click search all uh, so this is the find character uh, screen, uh, and this allows you to um, literally find any character within the game who currently exists. So we're going to change the gender to female, because we can only get married to a woman, um, at least in this period of history, um, and it would be frowned upon to try and do otherwise. Um, we are going to change the join court button to uh, yes. Because that sets things to people who are actually willing to join us. Um, uh, married, we're going to set to no. Because if they're already married, they can't marry us again. Because again, bigotry is not currently allowed. Um, we could have same religion, same culture. But right now, we'll just set it to that. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to sort the list by age. Um... And that's going to give us a bunch of options. So this this is a good uh, conversation piece, actually. So I mentioned in the previous two videos at some point succession law. And I mentioned that it's very dangerous for a kingdom um, to uh, ignore succession law and to, to not be aware of, of what can happen. You can build a remarkable kingdom and then... You can your character will die. So if Count Bathelio has, if we have seven children, and then Count Bathelio dies, our kingdom would be wrecked. Why is that? Um, it comes down to succession law, and different succession laws have different rules for where your titles go. So we discussed about titles, um, and 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 how they get divvied out, um, or or where they they exist for a character that is so succession law effectively controls where they get divvied out as i've just said uh, they determine who gets what in the event of your character dying and there being a succession one thing we can do so without going too deep into succession law just yet we'll do that after we've found a wife um one thing we could do under gavel kind is always being uh, uh, always ensure uh, that we have uh, a single male heir. So right now, if we click on Count Bethelio, we can see we do have exactly that. He has Bethel, uh, Bethelding, um, who has no siblings. Clicking on him, we can see, clicking on Bethelio, that is, we can see he's only got one child. We click on, he doesn't have any parents because the game has seeded him without any. Um, as of now, you'll be able to click through the list of characters um but i guess more on that later um if we click on uh son actually that will show we can see that he has a parent he only has a 
male parent because again the game is seeded it that way from now on when characters are created they'll be created from two other characters therefore there will be a man and a woman in the parents uh, and eventually there'll be grandparents and um, wards and siblings and, and everything in between uh, so for now we only have a single son uh, and for Gavilkine that's perfect um, because as I kind of I, I may have briefly explained it but just to explain it again the easiest way to get around Gavilkind is to ensure that all of your titles fall to your eldest son if you only have one son he is by default your eldest and your youngest son so he gets everything if you have more than one it gets more complicated we will discuss it in just a moment um, for now if we wanted to keep it the you know this way where we only have a single son um, we would um, potentially marry uh, Tassia the courtier of Bolzano uh, and why would we marry Tassia well because she's 58 years old she is the oldest woman that we can possibly marry right now um, she's the culture of Lombardy so that's not ideal uh, stat wise remember we get half of, uh, of our wife's stats um, so let's click on Bethelio again. Um, so we get half of our wife's stats. So if we were weak in a particular area, let's say Intrigue. Really good example. Because uh, we are particularly weak in Intrigue right now. We're also weak in Stewardship. But as a state score, we're particularly bad in Intrigue. And that's because we only have an Intrigue of 7. And our Spymaster is terrible. He has an Intrigue of 2. Um... We could find a wife that shores up those stats, and she will grant half her skill onto her state score. So, top of the list, we have uh, Tassia. She only has an intrigue of eight, so she would give us an intrigue score of uh, four. Um, we can look at her traits and see if they match up with us. She's ambitious. That can be good, can be bad. Um, generally, ambitious is a really good trait for us to have. It's a really good trait for our children to have. It's not a good trait for our vassals. And sometimes spouse, but it doesn't matter as much with spouse. Uh, but sometimes it can make her try and kill you. Or more likely kill any of the sons who are not from her. So if you end up with multiple marriages and you end up with sons from different mothers. Sometimes the mother can try and plot to kill the ones who are not hers. Um, because the game is good like that. Uh, and yeah, the... the the uh, historical realm here is pretty nasty brutish and short. So I might have mentioned that 41 is a pretty good age to start at. We're already quite far through his life. Uh, but likewise, people people plot to kill each other a lot in this game. Um, so yeah, we could marry uh, Tassia. And the reason we would marry Tassia is because she's too old to bear children. Um, I can't off the top of my head remember what the value is. It's maybe 45 or 50. But once they get to that age... The likelihood of bearing children either dips so low that it doesn't happen or it is removed. It, like There's a point where it gets removed completely. 58 is definitely old enough that she won't be having children anymore in the game. Um, so I would always recommend having a wife. Um, because you get half of her stats. So if nothing else, you want to farm them for stats. Um, that's the meta game rather than the role play. I guess if you want to role play not having a wife, then do that differently. Um, but I, I always, uh, I always prefer to have at least the, the stats because having some decent scores enables you to do some role play. To be fair, uh, so we could marry Ta uh, Tassia here. Um, and again, these people get randomly generated at the start of the game. Some of them, if they're important enough, would exist when the game starts. The portraits and the names probably always exist, but the, the scores that they generate uh, might be differently. However, I have noticed in every playthrough that I've ever uh, generated that there is one wonderful lady who I always like to hire for um, the, for the uh, Count of Bethelio, uh, which is this Augusta here, the courtier of... Uh, the courtier of... Is that Neapolis? Uh, in any case, this lady uh, is a homosexual. So one reason that we'd like to marry her is because her desire to have sex with our character is quite low. She's not into men. Um, it doesn't mean it's impossible because we're getting married and this is a feudal society. And one of the duties of a wife and indeed the, the ruler is to produce an heir. 
Um, so it was kind of expected that they just get it, get it over with, grin and bear it. Um, but it does give her a, fertil a fertility modifier of minus 15%. If we look at our traits, um, we don't have any modifiers. Now, in the video you'll see after this one, we generated a completely different Bethelio. Um, and he was uh, rubbish in terms of his stats, but he was lustful, so he had high fertility. Uh, and because of that high fertility, he did actually manage to get Augusta pregnant. So you'll see in future playthroughs, we do actually have another son um, already, and it has been uh, it was a son born for us by Augusta here. For now, the reason that we're going to select Augusta, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, twofold. One is uh, she's got amazing stats. Truly, truly amazing stats. 18 for diplomacy, 9 for martial, 9 for stewardship. I mean, that's not, like, great, but combined with a 17 for um, intrigue and a 13 in learning, she's a really good character. Um, and the reason that she's a really good character is this trait here. So if you look for the trait that's inside of a little heart, she's a genius, which is one of the best stats in the game. Um, and the reason that it's a brilliant stat is not only does it give plus five to everything um the little heart indicates that this is a genetic trait so she is genetically a genius so that means if she does sire a child be it a son or a daughter with campathelio there is a chance only a chance uh but but a chance nonetheless that that child would gain this trait and given that this trait gives plus five to every single stat, it's a really good trait. Um, there are other traits like it, uh, like quick. Uh, we notice this lady here is quick. She has the little green heart with quick in it. That's only plus three instead of instead of plus five. Uh, there is. Now I'm trying to think of them. I can't think of the. <laughs> I can't think of all the different traits. Quick is another really good one. Um, the opposite of quick would be slow. So there we go. This lady has a blue, uh, like, stupid face, basically, with a question mark. And if you hover over that, this character is not exactly blessed with the tearing intellect. That's minus three uh, to all stats. So this character is bad. That's why her stats are so bad, because she is slow. Uh, I think there's, there's all the, like, genetic traits that you can get, like, club-footed. Uh, who is not not currently appearing in the list? If I select any, maybe it will appear. Club. Uh, let's get rid of married to any. Join court to any. There we go. Club foot. Uh, so this character is club footed, and again, that's like a little blue heart. So that's a genetic defect. Um, that you can be born with and it gives you negative martial uh, and negative attraction so attraction is how likely another character of the opposite sex or same sex if they're homosexual because like i said they they exist in the game they're just frowned upon um in terms of like medieval society or feudal society um so that's just an example of like negative traits that um exist some of them are genetic and of course like clubfoot is just bad right it has no perk whatsoever Apart from same trait opinion. So other club-footed people will like you. Um, but yeah, I mean, like other ones. So club-foot is something you could be born with. There are other traits that you could develop. Uh, like maybe scarred. Uh, so this person is quick, which is awesome. But they're also scarred. Um, scarred can give opposite trait opinion plus 10. Um and some monthly prestige but again you kind of like scarred uh, it can scare people i believe um maybe it's not scarred is it disfigured so there's so many traits there you go this this character is disfigured a face a few could love diplomacy minus four attraction opinion minus 20 same trait opinion plus five so other disfigured people will like them uh, but otherwise, yeah, this this character's just not liked. Um, so yeah, that's just an example of the different traits that exist. Genius being great. There's a few geniuses in the world already. 
The one that we're interested in is the one that will join our court. So this means that they're prepared to join our court. That is a female who is not married so that we can marry her. Uh, and it was Augusta here. So what do these thumbs up mean? If I set the join court to any, we'll get a whole different set of results come back. The thumbs down means they won't accept an invite to our court. Bunch of reasons for that. Um, normally just because they're already in a better court than ours. Uh, so if they're already in the court of a duke or a king or an emperor or even a count who's just more powerful than we are or has given them a, uh, a position of power like they've seated them on the council or has the ability to press a claim for them. Uh, any of those reasons, they, they're they not willing to join us. Uh, and in fact, if we click on them, it might even tell us, right? So we can right-click on them, uh, do invite to court, and then when we hover over it, it gives us the reason why. Uh, so in her case, she just has no reason to move. Um, she likes us, plus like one tiny little bit, but otherwise she has no reason, just doesn't have a reason to move. Uh, so yeah, she's just better off where she is. Uh, if we set this to, oh sorry, if we scroll through until we find like a little, the, the halfway, like the little yellow hand there, uh, that says she might be convinced to join our court by a bag of gold. Uh, so if we first send her a gift, right click, send gift, and send her money, uh, and it will tell us that in the tooltip there that it would cost us 15 gold, uh, that would then mean that the next time that we right click her and do invite to court, she'd say yes. Um... In this case, we don't even need to bother with that. We can just set it to, are you prepared to join our court? Yes, Augusta is in that list. We know that we already want Augusta, so let's right-click her. Uh, let's do a si uh, arrange marriage. And Oh, let's do arrange marriage. And then we get this little uh, pop-up here. Uh, and what that pop-up means is that the character on the right is her liege. So Count uh, Gregoris there. Uh, and then the character on the left is us so we're picking someone we've already right clicked her so we know who we're kind of like arranging her like we're arranging it to be with her rather if we click that we get a list of people in our court who are unmarried um and i can't remember if i explain this in a later video so i'll just say it here uh, i think i do go into a later video people in our court we control who they marry so that's why we've got our court listed here uh, so let's click Count Bethelio because in this case we are unmarried and we are the ones that want to get married. So let's click Count Bethelio. And you can see here that we get proposed that Count Bethelio and Augusta get married. As a Count, Bethelio would gain zero prestige from marrying to House Corvina and minus 100 from marrying a courtier. What does that mean? Uh, she's a nobody. She's just a courtier. Um, she's not part of a great house. She's not a noble. She's not a court. Uh, she's not a countess herself. She's not a, du uh, a duchess or a, a queen or an empress. She's just a nobody. So because we're marrying somebody beneath our station, because we are a count, um, we suffer a prestige hit. Remember we said prestige is when you do impressive audacious things. Well, when you do something unimpressive, like marry a nobody who could well be, frankly, not that far from being a serving girl as far as some people are concerned then you negatively affect your prestige because you've married beneath yourself. Uh, it's just the way that people viewed the world back then and, well, to be quite blunt, nowadays, to be honest. So let's click um, let's click ourself and click send. So you notice that it says yes if we hover over it. Uh, her opinion of us is high enough that she would agree. Um, she's going to gain no prestige. We'll lose prestige. We are a nobody at this point. Um, we are a count, but we're a count of this, like, piffling little uh, county that nobody really cares about so there was no way we were going to get to marry a princess or you know marry the, the daughter of an emperor or anything like that uh, we were going to have to marry below our station but it's fine because we're going to marry a genius so we're all good so let's do that uh, notice nothing happens because the game is currently paused whenever you do any interactions like this in the game you've sent an invite it takes a day or two for that invite to get sent and then it takes a little bit of time for the reply to come and then once you get the reply as if by magic they'll appear in your court um, but it just assume that it's like 
transaction time for the letter to get to them it's not really realistic that it takes a few days for someone the other side of the world to get your letter and then appear in your court but it's just the way that the game chooses to abstract it uh so we've we should have that that alert's still there because we haven't unpaused but we've basically dealt with that so what i'm going to do at this point is i'm actually going to unpause the game by pressing the space bar or you can click the time up here plus and minus uh speeds up or slows down the game uh, we're going to leave it on the default setting for now. We're just going to press the space bar. The pause button will go away. We get that little arrow to indicate that we're on speed one. Uh, and time begins to pass. 3rd of January, 4th of January, 5th of January. This is the slowest speed that you can play the game on. So, seven days in. Hopefully our invite will get there soon and we'll get a response. He begins to wonder whether he actually clicked the send button. I'm sure I did. Honest. Let's do it again in case I didn't. Oh look, I've just dismissed it again. Oh, there we go. It did work. I just hadn't actually uh, waited long enough. Uh, so, what's this? So, this is Herlige saying that he agrees because he has to agree. She's in his court. I think we discuss court. Uh, we discuss like courts in the next video, so I'll leave it for that. Uh, but he has to agree and he has agreed so we can click OK on that and then we have this decision here which is directly tied to marriage um, Augusta and Count Bathilio are getting married we can collect a royal aid duty to pay for the ceremonies um, so we can say two different options here yes it is everyone's concern and we'll gain 17.5 gold or we can say no people respect wealth you can choose what you want to do here um, it's a massing a stat um again you can role play it uh i think we're already at negative 80 prestige which means people already think we suck uh so i would probably rather take the money um but yeah you choose um but we are now married if we pause the game we now have a wife and notice that our stats have gone up accordingly. We're better at diplomacy now. We're way better at intrigue. We're now 17. So that's 7 from our stat, 2 from our counsellor and 8 from our wife because that's half of her stat. I think it rounds because she's at 17. Plus there are actually like point variables in this game and it doesn't always dis uh, display them. Um, so that's cool. Now we've got a wife who is really good at intrigue. So let's do something intriguing. Uh, let's click on Chur down here. Why are we clicking on Chur? Uh, we're clicking on Chur because at the start of the game, there's a rather interesting um, happenstance for the uh, Count of Thurgau. We can immediately engage in a bit of intrigue that will increase our power. Uh, so if we just click... Uh, so if you just no notice here that we're currently... We hold the domain of the wrong type um so we, we discussed that already we've got a church when we really should have a castle um so if we just scroll or move the mouse down uh, we can see the barony of glerns that that's a castle right the barony and there's two little um shields here one is showing that it's inside of the kingdom of france here and the other one is showing the actual title of the barony of glerns if we click on that then it will show us the titles view for that holding and therefore because it's the title view it will show us who holds that domain so if we look there we can see well we can already see it here right we can see uh lutbert owns this if we hover over him we can see that he is a spy master as well as being the baron of glerns um and but if we just look above him we can see his current line of succession happens to be us interesting why is that well let's click on lutbert or lubert it's probably how you pronounce that i butcher the pronunci uh, pronunciation of uh um <laughs> pretty much everything in this game anyway uh so yeah get used to that um if we click on him we can see he doesn't have a wife right now um so because he doesn't have a wife, he hasn't had any children. He doesn't have any children. He doesn't have a wife, so he can't yet have any children. Um, and he has us as his heir because the, he has literally nobody else. Um, 
So that's really beneficial to us because if something unfortunate were to happen to him, then we are his, his heir. His title, the Barony of Glurns, would fall to us. And remember, as a noble, as a, as a gentleman, we should control a castle. Which is what he currently possesses. So he can he controls the very holding in the in the county of Chur that we should hold if we had, were to hold that realm. Um, so it would be a, it would be a terrible terrible shame if something were to happen to the Baron of of, of Glurns, wouldn't it? First, before we do anything like that, let's notice his ambition is currently to get married. Um, and that means that uh, he's in our court, so he's waiting for us to find him a wife. Um, let's first go to our council screen. Uh, we can click the little crown symbol up here, or we can press F3. And then let's click the appoint button here. Uh, we're next to our spy master, so this is Lubert of Glurns. And then we get a number of options that pop up for the... Um, who we could hire and it's basically giving us people who um have an okay intrigue score um so let's click on augusta because our wife can be a spy master i think we mentioned that and she has an amazing uh, intrigue score of 17 she's considered a masterful schemer so let's pick her so we've replaced baron lubert with augusta she is now our spy master now interestingly what we're about to do is plot to assassinate Lubert. The game allows us to do that even if he's our spy master. So that's kind of interesting. You can get your spy master to kill himself, which is a bit weird, but it does work. In this case, we're not going to play around with such bizarre shenanigans. We're just going to replace a very bad spy master, because he's actually so bad he probably wouldn't manage to kill himself. Uh, so we're going to replace him with someone who's actually good at their job, who happens to be our wife. And from a role play perspective, I kind of like um, in the other video. Uh, so in the future videos, you'll see that um, Bathelio really doesn't have good stats, uh, and I kind of like the idea that uh, his wife is the power behind the throne. She's the one. She's the genius pulling the strings, trying to make the realm bigger, and telling him what to do and what to say to people. In this particular video, he's actually a really solid. <laughs> Uh, commander so he could actually expand the realm via war so if I was playing this uh, as an actual playthrough I'd probably I'd probably play it a little bit differently and I'd probably uh, try and be more martial and, 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 and play the game that way but for the purposes of demonstration this is pretty good show off the mechanics uh, so we've now appointed her as our uh, spy master so if we click on the vassal tab uh, under the character screen we can see now that uh, Lupert's like little fist uh, has turned bright red. The, so Frederick is a vassal above him, uh, but Lupert is also a vassal because he runs that barony, uh, and now he's got a, a little like a, a red, really red fist. And that's uh, if you hover over it, it tells us that he's angry for not being on the council. Um, so again, you need to be aware of what you do with your vassals because if they desire to be on the council and you don't put them on your council, that makes them angry, and therefore they won't provide you with the full amount of levy, they won't pay the right amount of tax, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just all round bad to have angry vassals. This vassal shouldn't hopefully be a problem for us much longer. Uh, now that I've said that, we're going to end up failing the plot um, just hilariously, but hopefully hopefully we don't. Uh, so, we've replaced him, he's no longer spy master. he's just an angry vassal right now. So let's click on his portrait again. We could either go, you know, navigate to him in Chur, or we can click to it, click on him from the vassal screen. Uh, and then let's right-click on his character portrait, which gives a list of options, and we can click Plot to Kill. Uh, and then that gives us Count Bathelio has decided that it is time for Baron Lutbert to depart this world. Count Bathelio and his backers will look for opportunities to kill Baron Lutbert. The higher the plot power, the more likely they are to find openings. So we're going to click Do It! And you notice nothing has happened. Um, and the reason that nothing has happened is because we um, have now just added that plot to the plot screen. So if we press F7, that will take us back to the Intrigue tab, which you saw in the previous video. And now you can see that um, Baron Lutbert of Glurns is listed in, a, in my plots. 
uh, and we have a plot power of 72.8 and as it kind of said before plot power is the likelihood of the opportunities will come up to happen um i don't understand all of the mechanics around this i know that the higher the number the better and generally i find that you need to be over a hundred percent for it to happen if it's under a hundred percent i've never seen it happen so i don't know if it's not possible until you breach a hundred percent um my rule of thumb is get it to 130 to a, between 130 and 150 and it's very likely that somebody is going to die uh, you can even have like multiple plots kind of like pretty much kicking off at once um so there's a couple of buttons on this screen that we should be aware of so there's this one here which is to invite potentially useful characters to our plot uh, so let's click that and then you'll see there's a list of people who are potential plotters and next to each person there is a percentage value um, so that percentage value um, basically tells us how much they would contribute to the plot power pretty much um, so the first thing we're going to do is invite our spy master now she's already contributing to this because um, she's giving us such a massive intrigue boost in fact if we very quickly look at our council uh, not council look at our character you can see oh it's not updated because we haven't unpaused this intrigue score of seven plus nine this is gonna rock it up because she's gonna provide the full 17 in the state score plus half her score plus our personal score so we're gonna become real good at intrigue soon um but let's click on her she's gonna give us a whopping no don't click on her this is where i sometimes get the ui wrong right click on her and click uh, it, it automatically highlights invite to plot and then click send it will tell us that yes she's prepared to do this uh, we can't now right click on her again because we've already sent it again if we unpaused it would update this list um, all the people again with a little like halfway yellow hand would be willing to join the plot if we sent them some gold first but we're not going to even bother doing that uh, because there's plenty of people who are willing so we're just going to go through the list and invite all the people who said yet and that's going to be enough people to kill this guy off i think now there is another button if we go back to the intrigue screen this little checkbox here auto invite plotters this little checkbox means it will instead of you having to click that little plus button down here and go through the list and click all the people who were willing to join you could instead just check the auto invite plotters button and it will go through that list for you and add everybody who would be a thumbs up there is a reason that you might not want to do that. Um, it's rarely a problem. I prefer the control myself. Um, but the reason that you wouldn't want to do it is because occasionally people can blab. They can they can talk about you. They can get drunk and they can spill your plot um, while they're in the tavern. And then people will find out that you're plotting to kill somebody. Um, and that negatively impacts your... Definitely impacts your opinion with that person that you're trying to kill um but it can also damage your reputation with other people because they suddenly think that you're a horrible schemer and you're trying to kill people um or do other plots because it's not just plot plotting to kill in the game there are other plots available um but yeah you get you get a reputation as a as being a a, a horrible schemer basically so sometimes some characters are not particularly characters with low intrigue i think um they're more likely to spill the beans so if you want to try and keep this under wraps then maybe pick people who have a high opinion of you who have high intrigue who provide good plot power uh, and try and just trigger it that way we should be fine with this uh so we've kicked this off uh i am literally just going to unpause the game now and i'm going to press the plus button on my keyboard or you can press the plus or minus up here to just uh slowly increase the game speed to plus three uh, just to make things run a bit faster so we're just going to get a bunch of alerts now that tell people that they're happy to back our plot. Uh, oh, cool. Um, a, a war is happening. Uh, yep, yeah, so a bunch of people have agreed. If we hit F7, we can see three people have replied. We're already at 194.2 plot pair. This guy's dead, basically. That will that will cause a plot to, to fire very rapidly. Um, should I describe what's going on in here? After our plot is finished, I think. This is a war that is likely to be a holy war. It is a holy war. 
so we'll describe that, what's going on there, in just a moment. But first, what happens to Baron Lubert? Uh, another person has backed the plot. Dumpty dumpty dum. And now we wait. <laughs> we wait for something to happen. And that can happen in this game, right? Sometimes you will put it up to speed 5 and just watch it whiz by. Uh, definitely slow it down if you're at war or something like that. So that you can better control your troops. Uh, maybe we begin describing what's going on while we wait for something to happen. Because, it, again, it's RNG, right? Ooh, okay. Well, that's something we can talk about. The Lord of Aelmania have approved the institution of title revocation allowed. So, I think we mentioned in the previous video, uh, laws. And one of those laws was title revocation. Uh, so, our boss has approved the change of law to allow him to withdraw titles. That's bad for us. We don't want him to have that law. Um, but yeah, it means theoretically he could knock on our door and say, uh, Excuse me, please give me your, give me your title. Uh, and that could potentially ruin our game. Um, so hopefully he doesn't do that. Because that would suck. Ooh! My co-conspirator, Gotzalo, has procured a venomous viper. And sends word that it will soon dig its fangs into Baron Lubert. So there you go. It didn't take long for it to fire. Just a few months. Uh, so we're going to click just don't point that thing at me. That approves the plan. Uh, we'll just wait for it to fire. Uh, we're just going to pause the game. Because... I don't know if you heard, because I've turned the volume down a little bit, uh, but we just got like a little um, doorstep noise, uh, footsteps or slash doorstop noise or something. Uh, and it's this little message that's popped up here. So it's a message about a point counsellor has been received from Hanibi, uh, basically our, our liege, our boss. So if we click on that, uh, he would like to give us a seat on his council as the role of chancellor. It's an interesting choice, because I think we got better marshal. Yeah, like, Marshall would have been a better choice, because we've got 16 Marshall, but he wants us to be his Chancellor, which uses a Diplomacy stat. Uh, we're going to accept, because that was our ambition. So let's accept that. Unpause the game. Uh, and unpausing the game means it's telling us, Count Bothelio of Thurgo fulfilled the ambition to become Counselor. So we'll just pause it again. Uh, we're going to press the uh, F2 key to go back to the character screen. And you can see now we've just got the speech bubble or the thought bubble again for ambition. So if we click on that, we're now going to click build a war chest. Yes, prepare my realm for war. So what that one does is uh, it uh, says that we are preparing to build uh, a chest of gold up. Uh, depending on the level of our title. So as a count, it says that we want to save up 300 gold. We currently have 70, and we're earning 2.45 per month. Um, if we were a... In fact, if we hover it over it, it'll maybe tell us. Yes, if we were a duke, we would need uh, 500 gold. If we were a king, we'd need 700. And if we were an emperor, we would need 1,000. If we're successful, um, we get the war taxes modifier, uh, until the 29th of March 774 which is five years from now uh, and it would give us a national tax modifier of plus 10 percent and that's from the point that was successful so actually where it puts that date on it's not true that's basing it on if we from the time that we trigger it if that makes sense um, it's given us this new decision type up here to extort subjects so if we wanted to we could click this uh, extorting your subjects is a great way of quickly raising funds for your war chest beware though for this action will be seen as tyrannical by your subjects the mental health of rulers who care for their subjects may take damage from this action so if we click on Bethelio uh, he's deceitful he is gregarious stubborn humble um, he'd probably be okay if he had the kind trait and we did that um, it might stress him out. And stress is a big killer in this game. If I haven't already mentioned it. Um, so yeah. Doing things that make your makes your character stressed is bad. Um, I generally don't like doing that anyway. Because I don't like the militancy that it generates. Um, we would get away with it. In all likelihood. But I, gen I tend to avoid um, doing that. And like I said. If we needed money. We would just probably borrow it from the Jews right now. Uh, so let's just unpause. Hopefully our event's going to fire soon. And I need to talk about what's happened over here. 
Oh, look what's happened, guys. Success. The snake performed its duty with aplomb and pumped Baron Lubert full of deadly venom. It slipped away into the night and the guards are now too busy contending with a string of lethal snake attacks to search for those responsible. I could kiss that snake. Well, maybe not. Uh, so, you can see, uh, Camp Athelio of Thurgau was inherited from Baron Lubert of Glurns. We know exactly what we've inherited. We've inherited his um, castle. So if we click OK on that, we're going to hit pause and we're going to click on Chur. Uh, and notice that now the county capital of Glurn, uh, or the county capital of Chur, is Glurns. So we're no longer living inside of a church because as a noble, we should be inside of a castle. And that's now been made our county capital. Um, and just by achieving that, uh, look, county, Count Bethelio's levy has gone up considerably. Um, most importantly, if we go to the... Uh, military tab um, our personal levy has really increased uh, so that's just because we've taken on the, this realm now belongs to us and nobody else we don't share it with a vassal we're not asking them what their opinion is we, we're not telling them oh you need to give us this obligation we're saying hey that castle's mine and all bloody soldiers inside it belong to me and they'll do what I say so it's very very good to expand your personal holdings uh, so that's the the first expansion we have done in our realm, and we did it through intrigue, uh, through trimming, changing our councils. We've trimmed a vassal who was useless. Uh, we've found a wife who's made us more powerful, and we've used her to good effect to um, get rid of somebody out of our realm and expand our realm without even having to raise a single troop or sharpen a single axe. Uh, we just literally sent a snake to do our job for us. So uh, thank you very much to our wife. Uh, so, that's shown you a little bit of intrigue. How far are we? About 40 minutes. So we've been doing about an hour per playthrough so far. So we've got a little bit of time to discuss a few more concepts. Um, so I might wrap it round about here. But that's pretty good. Um, the other bit that we were going to explain was what happened over here. Uh, so, you might have noticed there was a ton of troops all over middle france here uh, and now there's just one and that's because when you raise your levies they all get raised uh, in the region that they belong to so it'll be easier for me to demonstrate this i think let's go to the military tab and we're going to click raise levies and notice that we raise levies here in thurgau and here in chur um so that's because we own two different counties and we have troops in both. Now, at the moment, all we raised was our personal levies. Um, we could um, we could go back to the military tab and we could also raise our vassal levies. Notice there's now little two little shields in each province and that's because there's two armies. If we click through them, you see there's seven there and 44 there. So our vassals really don't give us much. But if we go back to the military tab, you can see... Our personal levies are costing us two gold a month, but the vassals are costing us zero because our vassals are paying. Um, you might also notice that there's this little icon here that says ruler present, and that's because we're currently marching with this army. Uh, and that gives a morale buff to the army because we, as the ruler, are leading it. If we press the F2 key and have a look at um, Bathelio, because he's got such a really good martial score, and personal combat score. That's not actually a bad choice. Uh, but we could click this little button here. With the sword and the shield. And if we click that. That forbids us from leading armies. Notice the little icons disappeared now. Uh, or click it again to put us back. Uh, but we'd have to then manually reassign ourselves to that army. Um, you can. Box select your troops. Um, move them together. By right clicking. And then hit the G key. Uh, that shows you, um, that will merge your troops together. And then you can also, by selecting an army, you can pick the characters that are assigned. So this has automatically got one of our commanders assigned to it. This doesn't have a commander. We could assign ourselves by right clicking, or by single, left clicking the no character button uh, and selecting ourselves. We can currently only do it on the uh, left or uh, middle flank there is no uh, right flank currently because uh, we just don't have enough troops to make one if we formed all these together we probably would uh, so yes 
that's useful. Um, I can't remember if I showed this stuff off in a future video, so I don't want to repeat too much stuff in case I make you watch it all again. Uh, so I'm just going to show you like pathfinding. So when you click, um, when you right click with a unit, that decides where they go. If you shift right click, you can define their troops. So the AI will automatically define a course, but if there's lots of enemies around, they might pick a bad one like this. Say there's somebody in uh, Basel, we don't want to walk through there. So instead we could right click on Zurich Gau, or, or indeed, maybe we don't want to go to the third Gau, maybe we want to go Swiss, then shift right click, right click, right click, right click. That would allow us to like define where we go more. I might have already described that in a future video, so I don't want to go too much into that. Um, the concept of locked movement as well. Uh, at the moment I can change the direction that everyone's moving in, but after a certain amount of time, if I hover over it, it'll tell us... Their movement would become locked on the 19th of May. So in eight days, moving to Schwiss uh, would be unavoidable. They won't get there until uh, the 13th of June. So it will take a long time to get there. Um, but by the 19th of May, that's it. And that's important because if you're marching somewhere and somewhere else is marching there, you can end up being locked into a battle that you didn't want to otherwise have. But I don't want to stray too much onto the territory of what I believe is in a future video. Uh, what I did want to show you is that there's a holy war over here. And I don't believe we've discussed that anywhere else. So that's something that we can talk about. So what's a holy war? And well, all that's happened here is that these troops have all merged together. Much like we were going to do there. Um, so that's why it's currently one, one soldier instead of all the many soldiers. Um, if we click on this button here... It shows us uh, that there is a holy war uh, going on for Barcelona. Um, so who currently declared it, I believe, is on the left. So I believe that uh, Sultan Abd al-Rahman of the Umayyad Sultanate, which is this big blob of Muslims down here, um, and they're also down here, um, he has declared a holy war over Barcelona. So what is a holy war? A holy war is a war that you can declare on someone who is a religion not of you. So in this game there are Catholics. Um, can Is there a screen I can show you the different religion types? That's the wrong button. I wanted to press the comma key to load the uh, ledger. Uh, I might be able to show you in the ledger, maybe. Religions. There we go. Uh, so you can see there's Catholic, Orthodox, Sunni, Shia, Pagan, Cathar. I mean, there's a lot, right? Uh, and they each have different kind of rules. So there's, there's, and they each work differently. That's perhaps worth pointing out. So when we started, we, we were a Germanic culture that is Catholic. So there are rules that govern the way that we have to go to war. Uh, and we're very much like the head of our religion is the Pope. He can call crusades and then we can join them. Warring against other Christians is sort of frowned upon, but is permissible within, um, within the realm we'll discuss that later um if we want to fight um if we want to fight these muslims though then we could do uh providing we fight the top left again uh their vassal protects them so we could um we well we could but we can't because we currently have levies raised uh and we apparently don't have a, a valid cassius belly uh and we're also at war with him already uh but i believe that we can always declare a holy war against someone who's a different can maybe we can do it with saxony if i dismiss these levies because uh, uh the saxons are uh pagans i think yeah they're pagans so can i declare war on these pagans nope I don't have a valid Cassius Belly. Interesting. I was pretty sure you could always declare a holy war. But a holy war is against a religion anyway. Um, I'll have to do a little bit of reading to remind myself about what the... I've declared holy wars as well. This is what's crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that you as a character can declare. So as a uh, count, I... Oh, maybe I can't declare it because I'm a count. Maybe I'm not important enough to declare it as a count. Because the holy wars that I've done it as were when I was a king. Um, 
But yeah, when you declare a holy war, it's you as a character deciding that your realm is going to war against an other realm that is of a type of religion. But you declare it to be a holy war, and that broadens the conflict. If I decided to fight, if I decided to say I'm claiming Urgel here in the name of Christendom, that's the just like claiming a province, just like me saying I want to fight over Chur. Um, that would be what I would gain if I won, but all of the Muslim faith were, uh, and these are Sunni Muslims, so all of the Sunni Muslims would be able to um, join this conflict if they wanted to and fight me over this. So it's a very broad war, the alliance is based on religion. The difference between a holy war and a crusade is that I can declare holy wars, or well, apparently I can't, um, but characters can declare, declare holy wars, but the Pope is the one who declares crusades, and then you join the Pope's crusade. So that's the like fundamental difference. Uh, what else? That's holy wars, that's kind of a little bit of how Levy works. I kind of don't want to go into any more detail because I'm a bit worried that well, A, we're, we are approaching the hour mark, the magic hour mark. We've kind of showed you a little bit of skullduggery. We've shown you getting a wife. In the next video, I'm pretty sure that we take you through like a little bit of claims and warfare. Um, so it will be slightly jarring. The The numbering of the sessions will, will go out of whack slightly. Um, the uh, Camp Athelio becomes very different. His stats are very different. Some other events have happened that that don't happen here um we'll start the next video at war not just in a holy war because i think we i think this happened in our previous game as well uh, but we'll also start with our liege being at war with the king of uh, bavaria fighting over augsburg uh, and we describe a little bit about how his troops get raised and how that war gets fought what sieges look like um, if my memory serves me, that's what we discuss. And then as the videos progress, we'll then talk about um, how we would prosecute a war ourselves and how we can take advantage of the situation, grow our realm. And we yeah, we discuss like levies and warfare and, and all of that sort of good stuff. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to take you through in this video. So I'm going to put a cut in here. Um, as before, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're finding it useful. Um, and I will see you in the next one.